One of the things that I feel is what I feel is most important about the discovery of nothingness or what you're calling Dharmakaya is that when, when we discover that who we are both for, first of all it's not who we think we have been you know that we're not the conditioned psychological self that our deepest sense of identity is deeper than a psychological self it's deeper than a than, than, a, than an ethnic identity it's deeper than any anything that we can see or locate in time and space or in form so when we awaken to that part of ourself that 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 can't be touched it can't be tasted that's not an object that can't be located but that is uh, the, the deepest ground of our being, when we realize that it's, it's, in, its nature is infinite, it's everywhere and nowhere simultaneously, and when we, when we have enough spiritual maturity and enough trust to kind of allow ourselves to experience the, the impossibility, as you were speaking about it, of its, of its true nature, uh, what, uh, what ultimately happens and what the goal is is that we, we let go, you know, which is obviously not a new concept, it's not a new idea, but it's, it's what it is. So if, we're, if we if we have the spiritual maturity and the courage to once we actually begin to cognize and, and, and are able to cognize that which we cannot be understood by the rational mind, you know, that, that which is our, our deepest nature, we begin to let go of, of all relative notions of self. It doesn't mean that we completely disregard them because relatively speaking, all these different relative dimensions of self are still real. But we're, we're no longer identified with them in the same way we were before. They're just they're relative sheaths or layers that are coverings over this, this essentially empty or infinite ground that we all are. And so the, the effect this has is it frees us. It frees us to kind of embrace the, you know, the, the, gift, the gift of, of evolutionary becoming. And, and then we're in a position to be able to, to embrace and to... Uh, uh, be, become a, 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 a liberated and become an expression of what it could be to be a liberated human being. And that also, it also means embracing all the different dimensions of ourself. But in this case, from a perspective of, of spiritual enlightenment, we would then choose to embrace all the dimensions of ourself that would be useful, that would be helpful, that would be positive and life-affirming and life-empowering for self and other. And we would choose to, from the perspective of this, of this pr of primordial emptiness or dharmakaya, to uh, to choose to, to not have a relationship with all these other different dimensions of ourselves that are unwholesome and, uh, uh, and are antithetical to, to the evolution and upliftment of the whole process. So Andrew, how do you feel that this um, evolutionary unfolding or this great release or recognition of our true nature, which is wisdom or self-realization, really informs a more um, empathic or, you said, positive or constructive, like loving and kind and, you know, selfless way of life. It sounds a little um, cool and, and mental sometimes to me. And, you know, as we all know, or I, I will say that I'm well positioned to con criticize my own uh, Buddhist tradition. Sometimes it only seems about enlightenment from the eyebrows up. <laughs> Mind and mindfulness and awareness and intelligence and so, uh, wisdom and discriminating awareness and so on. What about the heart? Not to make a gross, too much of a distinction, but how does this relief, whether seeing our true nature, our timeless and boundless uh, nature, really help the greater whole? Because this is really not about us individually anyway. I mean, we're just here like fireflies for a few moments on the cosmic clock. How does this really inform or edify, illuminate, or even just entertain, in a positive sense, <laughs> the greater whole, all, all of us and all beings. Well, well, in, well I, from my own, speaking from my own experience, in, in my discovery of this dharmakaya or this nothingness, what, what, I, what happened to me was, what emerged in my own experience was the recognition, and it's, and it's continued for almost 25 years, uh, to my day-to-day -day amazement that there is a, is a part of myself that is free from anything that ever happens. And, and, and that dimension of myself reveals itself uh, daily. And no matter what any other part of myself thinks might be the case or might be true, there's another part of myself that is always completely untouched by anything that's ever happened and is always unconditionally, radically, uh, profoundly enthusiastic 
about making this world a better place. Now, it doesn't come from my condition, this aspiration, this, this evolutionary spiritual aspiration to make the world a better place, to leave the place, the world a different place because I was here. And I hope that doesn't sound too uh, grandiose. It doesn't come from, a, it's, not a personal, it's not a personal desire that Andrew has, but, it's, but it's, it's what I continually discover in myself, that there's a deeper part of myself that is very busy and very perpetually excited about the, about the possibility of making the world a better place. And so when we discover that, that, that the deepest part, that, that what is emerging from the deepest part of ourself is an aspiration to, to to in some way improve the process that made it possible for us to be here. And it doesn't come from the conditioned mind. It doesn't come from the psychological self. It doesn't come from our cultural, it, the culture hasn't taught us that. And yet we awaken to the deepest part of ourselves. But there seems to be a motive that's active within the process to, to improve the universe that it created. And the, the, the experience of that is so, it gives us so much confidence in life. Well, what I notice, and um, this is, perhaps just local to my own you know, little circles, is there's a tendency to um, misunderstand nothingness or emptiness or mm. shunyata or oneness or one taste. These are all more or less synonymous, not exactly, for a nihilism or you don't have to do anything. Or what did you say? There's a part of you that's already perfectly, uh, already enlightened, you know, I think Ken Wilber calls it always already. Yes. In Dzogchen tradition, we call it primordial perfection and beyond notions of perfect and imperfect, mm -hmm. just that immaculate, untouchable, groundless ground that is not affected by our uh, karma and conditioning in this life, the d deathless dharmakaya nature of our true uh, being. So, but I think that this, this notion of the, the uh, positive dharma, the, the, the luminous immediacy of beingness, which it's really not a thing, and yet it's very vividly alive, like in Tibetan tradition we call it the rainbow body, rainbow body of enlightenment, not the big nothing, not nirvana as extinction, but as joy, as delight, as bliss, as, as deathless ease, and so forth. It's very important to keep in mind and, and to see if it's really coming out in our life from our understanding or realization of this great, no, nothingness, so that there's no self and there's no anything and we're all one, however we kind of just generally think about it. So I myself feel, you know, in my prayer life or my meditations, there's really a place that's not far from almost what we hear in the theistic traditions, which are easier to talk about. Most of us have come from theistic, Judeo-Christian probably backgrounds about surrender or letting go or not Self-emptying, I think the Christians call it. It doesn't mean we have to slay the ego, but self-emptying. The less of myself is there. This is the meaning of nothingness to me. The less of myself is there, the more room there is for Buddha nature to manifest. The more room there is for the clear light to come through. The more room there is for God to live here, if you want to talk in theism. And that's the big nothingness, which really is something. It's not nothing. It's not a nihilistic nothing. It's, a, it's an effulgent uh, radiance. And that's part of what I call positive Buddhism, which I think we need to talk about today, not necessarily here, but in, in our public conversation in these decades, not just about no self and impermanence and renunciation and how life sucks and then you die. And the first noble truth, dukkha, which I translate as skruka, screwed from the first. <laughs> suffering, the satisfaction, the positive Buddhism, the freedom of possibility. Yes, everything is dysfunctional, but that's not the only way. Maybe, there is the maybe other together truths. we can, maybe we can re, re, rewrite the Four Noble Truths for the, for the, for the postmodern post -post age. Well, that's a great ambition, okay. 